Now, last week we started some things we're going to finish up today, but we have to, as believers in Christ, recognize something, that there is a final day coming. There is a judgment day coming. Right. right now we're not judged and punished, but there is a judgment day coming. For every single one of us who believe in Jesus Christ, judgment day is going to be sweet. Amen. Every one of us who believe in Jesus Christ will stand before Jesus. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in our body according to what we've done, whether good or bad. We will stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. Non-Christians or unbelievers do not stand before Jesus. Jesus said, I don't, if, if you reject me or my words, uh, I don't judge you. You have one that judges you if you don't believe in Jesus. It's the words He spoke judge you. So you can either have the words He spoke judge you, or you can have Jesus the person judge you. Which one would you prefer? Jesus, Jesus the person. The words He spoke, what it does is show you that you're a sinner without a Savior. And so everyone who doesn't have Christ stands before the great white throne at that judgment. And then they are read from the books, and then justice prevails, the explanation is given, and then they are thrown into the same place where the devil and his fallen angels are, to be separated from God for eternity, or separated from the love of God for eternity. Amen? Yeah. But. The good news for Christians is that we get to stand before Jesus the Savior who bought us and paid for our sins so we don't have to be punished for our sins. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So the judgment seat of Christ is reward day for believers. Hallelujah. Some get a little reward, some not so much reward, but there's going to be some things discussed on judgment day. That's right. And so that's where we started last week is that there are things to be discussed when you meet Jesus. And you will meet Jesus and stand before the judgment seat of Christ by yourself. Amen. Yes. You Amen. don't get your children to be with you. Come on. You don't get your spouse to be with you. You don't get uh, the so-and-so Christian who was a hypocrite to be with you. You don't get to finger point. You don't get to rest on anybody. It's just you. Come on. And so that's why on this earth, you are responsible, number one, for you. That's right. We all would like our spouse to do this or that or whatever, make right decisions. We'd all like our children to be. We've given our life for our kids, blah, blah, blah. But you are responsible for you first. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, we just established last week that uh, those that are prepared for judgment day, or we could say test day, are those, excuse me, those who are excited about test day are those who are prepared yeah. for test day. Yeah. So I understand that in the room right now, there's some people thinking, oh my gosh, where is he going with this? <laughs> what requirements going to be placed on me? Uh, the truth is, for the Christian who walks with Jesus, judgment day is a delight. Yeah. Reward day is exciting and it's expected and I can't wait to get to that day. And so test day is easy if you're ready. Amen. And so that's my job, and that's really all of our job to help each other, is get ready and make sure we're prepared. Make sure we got all the cheat sheets in our heart. Make sure that we've taken all the preliminary tests, all the sample tests, know exactly what's going to be on the test. Wasn't that the best kind of test to take when you knew exactly what was going to be on it? Yep. When the teacher gave you all the questions ahead of time, wasn't that the best yeah. Yeah. test to take? Sure, well, we got that. We got the, the, the questions. We've got the discussion. We know what's going to happen on Judgment Day. At least some of us do who have studied the Bible, and that's why we're going to talk about it today so that we all know. Amen? Amen. Now, before we uh, begin, let me say this. Let me, let me just quote some scripture to you to help you realize that on this day, you're not going to have to rehearse every deep and dark sin that you committed in the earth. Okay? As long as you had already acknowledged it, already learned, already understood the will of God, repented, got it right in your heart concerning these sins. Now, if it's something you were hiding, if it's some conscience thing that you never addressed, you will have to discuss this before God. But if it's something that you've already understood enough to place under the blood of Jesus, been forgiven of, felt clean in your own heart about, uh, there won't be repercussions for that. 
Are you ready? Thank you, Lord. Here's the proof. <clears throat> God said this in Hebrews chapter 8, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Hallelujah. It doesn't say I'll remember their sins no more until judgment day, then I'll drag them all up. No, God's been trying to help us throw our sins away and forget them like He has. Yeah. Yeah. We can't let our past haunt us, and you won't be haunted on Judgment Day. At least believers won't be. Yeah. Hebrews 10 says, Their sins and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. Now, where there's forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering for sin. Sin's already been paid for. We don't need to re-offer for it. Uh, same thing with punishment. Punishment's already been paid by Jesus, so you're not going to be punished. Thank you, Lord. He took your punishment. He took your beating. He Thank took your whipping. He Amen. took your, you, your stripes. So you don't have, you're not going to get striped on the day of judgment. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? Yes. Isaiah 44, I've wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me for I've redeemed you. As far as the east is from the west, Psalm 103, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Micah chapter 7, he'll have compassion on us. He'll tread our, tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you'll cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Glory. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory. Romans chapter 5, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 8, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, you're not condemned, you're not punished. Hallelujah. And you don't have to carry guilt around with you. You know, we've been trying for however long this church has been up to help Christians get rid of the guilt factor by understanding the blood of Jesus factor. Amen. That the blood of Jesus cleans your guilty conscience so that you're able to serve God better. Amen. Able to approach God better. You can't approach God if you feel guilty. So you have to approach in the blood of Jesus. We only have a right to enter the holy place where God is by the blood of Jesus. Amen. But then in the blood of Jesus, we absolutely have access to God. The blood is powerful. We need to know it. John chapter 3 said, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Believe in Christ. Not God, but believe in Christ. Is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. John chapter 5, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Keep that in mind as we move through here. Amen. God paid a dear price for your sins, not to have to be rehearsed forever and ever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you Lord. Turn to the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, we'll start there. Read a few scriptures, then we'll move on. We're going to talk today about what we get if we overcome. Uh -huh. And we're going to discuss the five crowns uh, mentioned in the Bible. Five crowns that people, once we go into glory, may obtain. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Is everybody there? It says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let, let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. You can apply this first to, to spiritual things. Did we do spiritual things right? Did we do spiritual things that merited something? Or did we just do frivolous things? Did we get caught up in ceremonial things that had no real result? Right. That's right. Right. We'll all find out on the final day because of the fires. We'll have to dump all these in the fire and see what comes out. Amen. Amen. Amen? There's argument about how to do church these days and what ought to be happening and what ought to be part of our spiritual life and what not. There's argument about it. But I say there is a right and there is a wrong. Right. Amen. There is a best. Amen. There is a worst. And there's a lot of in-between. And the fire is going to tell it. 
Amen? Amen. Yep. And so sometimes you just got to quit arguing and say, okay, we'll just find out in heaven. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Notice that God knows the heart. He knows exactly the motives of the heart. And so on the final day, everybody's heart will be known. All the things will come clear. If you did things with an honest and, and pure and good and true heart, you'll get treasure for it. Absolutely. Even if nobody in the earth saw it, even if, even if you weren't rewarded in the earth, even if you never got paid in the earth, even if you never got the accolade, even if you never got the name on the door, even if you were never approved of, even if everybody hated it, if you did it with a right, pure motive and it was truth, then you'll get rewarded in heaven. Hallelujah. 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 There's a lot of reward that we get today that's all public, but on the final day, it'll be all that closet stuff you did that was right. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, one page over to the right, verse 25. Uh, let's read verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know those who run in a race? All run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Doesn't mean just one of us gets the prize. It's your race. You need to win it. Yeah. Everybody's got a, a similar race, yet individual race. Verse 25, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. It means you govern yourself, discipline yourself. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Think of the effort put into the Olympics, how much they train to be perfect, right? Well, they do it to get a, a gold medal that's never even turned in for money. It's perishable. But we do it for an imperishable crown. That's the first crown we're going to talk about the imperishable or the incorruptible crown. <clears throat> Verse 26, Therefore I run this way, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Meaning, living the Christian life has a reward to it. It's not like you're just fighting the air for nothing. Right. People have given up on the Christian life because it's hard. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. It's not advantageous. I thought I was going to be benefited somehow. No, no, no. You've got to believe the truth above what you've felt. There is a reward. Okay? Not, you're not just beating the air. Verse 27, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Notice this imperishable crown comes because you've disciplined yourself. Put yourself under the governance of God and your own spirit, man. Amen. Able to discipline yourself. Able to give up certain things. Sacrifice. There's a certain sacrifice that Christians must uh, give to God. Isn't that right? We sacrifice our life in many ways to live unto God. Amen? Amen. Where we're not our own God. We sacrifice our own Godship. Every human would prefer to be their own God. It takes a bold, courageous person to submit to the true God. Amen. All right. Turn to the book of Revelation. Oh, no. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me review from last week. Here are the eight things that I've found that will be discussed on Judgment Day. The Bible never says there's eight things, but it looks like we could categorize most things in this eight. Uh, number one was this. When we stand before Jesus, we will discuss, did we or not seek God first? Did we love God first? Did we obey the first commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind? Did we seek God first? Was He, even though some people say it, well, God's first, he, you know, God's first in my life. Is He? Is He really? Is He the one you seek after? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things are added to you. Or are you seeking the other things too much? Is God really first? Do you really love God? Because if you love God, not just in word, not just in a sentence that sounds kind of cool, not just like military people that God first, country second, and whatever they, I don't know the deal. Uh, is, he, is he really? Is it just cute to say? If we love God, then we love Jesus because he is God. So no, no unbeliever in Jesus can actually say they love God. Jesus even mentioned that. If you don't love him, 
who He sent, how can you love Him? If you don't love the Son of the Father, how could you say you love the Father? You don't. So if you love God, you love Jesus. If you love Jesus, you love Jesus the head. If you love Jesus the head, you must love Jesus the body, right. which is the church, right. the body of Him that fills all in all. That means you love Christians. Right. Extra. And you know where Christians are? They're a church. <laughs> and so if you really love God and you seek Him first, then you love Jesus and you love the church and you're there. There's the church plug. The reason we do church plugs is not so we can keep a bunch of people in the building. It's because you desperately need to be committed yes. to the body of Christ. Amen. Desperately. 50% of your life is by yourself. You can believe in Jesus, learn of Jesus, glory in Jesus, witness for Jesus. Do all sorts. 50% of your life is by yourself. The other 50% is with Christians. So if you never go to church or never plugged into the body of Christ, the best score you can get is a 50. I'm committed to Jesus that I'm committed to Jesus the head. I'll take his head, but I don't want any part of that body. I've been in those bodies. I've been in those churches. I don't want any part of the church. You better watch it. Amen. Okay. Keep that in there. Don't don't erase that out of the video, okay? So number two is the second great command. Just like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the love walk discussion you're going to have. Did you walk in love towards your people? Did you walk in the love of God towards your people? Not just in a casual friendship love, but in a deep love of God that considers others, is never rude to others, is never irritable around others, is always considerate of others' feelings is able to overlook people's sins. The love of God is just so deep, so wide, so broad. And I pray that you all know the love of God. Isn't that what Paul prayed? I want you to know the length and breadth and width and height and the love of Christ which passes knowledge. The love of God doesn't make any sense how God could love a sinner, but He loved you. It doesn't make any sense how God could overlook your sins a thousand times. It doesn't make any sense to the natural mind. Passes all knowledge how He could keep overlooking your stupid habit. <laughs> but when you realize how sincere He is about overlooking it with a good attitude. See, we're talking about a good attitude. Love covers your attitude. Well, I'll forgive them. Well, good for you, but that wasn't the attitude of love. God's able to look your stuff a thousand times, a thousand times over, at least 490 times in a day. And all He asks for from you is to do the same. That's all. Just when you get so mad at somebody and you think they deserve such penalty, just remember God has put up with you. That is the love of God. And it passes natural knowledge and it's deeper and you got to pursue it and you got to really get filled with the Spirit and pray in tongues and dig down into it and study Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4 and 5 and Ephesians 1 and 1 Corinthians 13 and, all, and the whole book of 1 John and all the love chapters and all the love scriptures and it'll just change your whole life. Amen. If you yield to it. Amen. So Judgment Day at the seat we'll be discussing did you yield to the love law, the royal law of love, which is love your neighbor as yourself. Number three, we will discuss, did we yield ourselves to the great commission? Mm -hmm. We got commands one and two discussed. Now we got the great commission, the number one work, the number one task at hand on the earth for the Christian. We'll discuss it. Did you yield yourself to be a witness, to share your faith, to talk to others about Jesus? a lifestyle that pointed others to Jesus and express the hope or reason for the hope that's within you. Yeah. Amen? That's good. Number four will be our character. We will discuss character. Did you, were you good? Now good is relative, isn't it? I'm pretty good. Not so bad. Better than them? Not better than them. <laughs> 
But character will be discussed. 1 Peter chapter 1 here, verse 13. It says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Before you were walking with God, you were ignorant. That's right. That's right. People still don't like to be called... Even People don't like their old man to be called ignorant. <laughs> the Bible says you were ignorant pursuing your former lusts. The lusts of the world were pursued by ignorance. Yep. That's right. We were all there. Verse 15, But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it's written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Yeah. Notice that word, conduct your time here in fear. I thought we're trying to free people from fear. Well, yeah, let's, let's shake the bag and understand it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, having a fear of God or a fear of the Lord is like a child fearing a parent in a healthy way. We're not talking about children being scared of parents, like, oh my gosh, they're going to kill me. Oh my gosh, I can exp they're going to, you know, make blood flow. Parent children should never be scared of their parents going to injure them. Okay? Amen. Being rebuked and being stern and, and even, a, even a, a whipping, even a, even a spanking is not going to tarnish the child. Yeah. But children, think about it. You know, oh... My, my, what are my parents going to think? That's the fear of God. What are my parents going to think? What are my parents, what is my dad going to think? What's my mom going to think? That's how we're supposed to treat the Father. Amen. He's with us. He's our Heavenly Father. We should live our life knowing that my Heavenly Father cares. What's my father going to think about that? That's the fear of God. It's respect. It's honor and respect and submission. It's not to be petrified. Make sense? But without partiality, he will judge according to each one's work. Okay, number five, or the fifth thing discussed at the judgment seat of Christ will be family matters. Family matters. Some people think family matters are number one. Well, as long as I take care of my family, I think maybe I'll be okay on judgment day. No, no, I think that there is a little bit of an order here of things that will be discussed. And family will be included, it's just not top of the list. You do need to care for your family. The Bible says if anybody does not provide for his own, especially to those of his own household, he's worth, worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. So you need to work and you need to provide for your family. Amen. Not at the expense of all spiritual things, but you do need to provide for your family. And we could just include spiritual things in providing for your family. Parents, you're going to have to train your children up in the ways of God. It's not enough to put food on the table. You've got to also put spiritual food in the child. Amen. They're not going to do it on their own. You have to make decisions to order your steps and the family steps, which includes the children's steps. Amen. So did you train up the child in the way he should go? Did you learn enough about God to be the example and to teach and train your children? I think that will be discussed on Judgment Day. Right. For children, uh, you, will be, you will have to discuss, did you honor your mother and father? Sure. Did we keep a right attitude toward family members? Parents, did you uh, treat one another properly? Did you provide good example for children? Isn't that right? Yeah. So those things will be discussed. Did you uh, order your children and instruct your children? Uh, or did your children order you and instruct you? Remember the story of the Duke of Wellington or the Duke of Windsor or whatever came and visited America years ago and was leaving and they got on the plane and and uh, somebody said, well, what, did you, what impressed you the most about America? And the fellow said, you know what impressed me most about America is the way that the parents obeyed their children. <laughs> and you see in this culture today, it's, it's gravitating to that more and more and more. It's actually predicted in the Bible that in the last days, children will become disobedient to parents. And it's this whole yielding to the whims of the child, letting the child dictate, you know, what they do on the weekends, what they eat. What do they eat? Well, they eat chicken tenders, you know, and fries. What do you want to eat? Chicken tenders and fries. 
chicken tenders and fries, chicken tenders and fries. There's more to eat than that. But these days, if you try to instruct a child to eat something different, there's a fit at the table half the time. I think that's just an, an example of how the children are getting the upper hand because culture's allowing them to. And that's a whole other message and a whole other discussion, but just we have to guard against some of these things and make sure the parent's still the leader of the family. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. you got to lead your kid to church or he won't go. Yeah. yeah. And half the time, the children want to come to church and the parent's too lazy to go. We've had that happen so many times. More times than not, the children want to come to church. Yeah. Deep down, the child that receives Jesus wants to be there. But there's so many things going on, the parent would sometimes rather their child be a great baseball player than a... And I'll move on. Number six. The sixth thing we'll be discussing is money matters. Did you know that you'll be talking to Jesus about money? Did you know that? Even though you can't take any with you. When you get to heaven, you will discuss how well did you think about, treat, handle, in your heart, money. Why? It's because money is so important to people. Money is one of the top two things we need to live in this earth. Isn't that right? They don't believe me. Here I'm talking about money. It's like, oh my gosh, people pulling their toes back. Yeah, you will be discussing money. The Christian and his money is a topic in the Bible over and over and over and over again. We have to have a right attitude about money. We have to have a right belief about money. We have to know money is a tool, never anything to be sought after. Money will be discussed. The Bible says that you cannot serve God and money or mammon. You can't serve God and material things. Either you'll love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. So we can't serve God and money, and you need to you know, really take account of your life. Is your heart pursuing money too much? Is your mind thinking about money too much? Are you too worried and concerned about money? All these things just show that you're pursuing money too much. Your heart's not right about it. You've got too much emphasis there. Here's what the Scripture says. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6. Remember, Jesus challenged the rich young ruler... He said, uh, the rich young ruler came asking, how's he going to get eternal life? Jesus said, keep the commandments. He said, I've done them all. I've done this, that, and the other. And Jesus said, there's one thing you haven't done. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. The Bible says the rich young ruler went away grieved and saddened in his heart because he had great possessions. So when Jesus touched that most precious thing to him, he got offended. Isn't that right? People do that all the time with the thing that's most precious when the, the Word of God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit or the, even the preacher or even your friend touches something that is precious to you that's not quite right according to God, the tendency is sometimes to get offended unless you're very open to God and you say, oh, really? Oh, man, I've got to check myself. It's a lot better to say, oh, let me check myself than don't judge me. If you don't judge yourself, you will be discussing it on Judgment Day. Yes. Judge yourself that you be not judged. If you'll judge yourself now, you won't have to talk about it on Judgment Day. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke account their masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and His doctrine may not be blasphemed. And all those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they're brethren, but rather serve them because those who are, uh, the, who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. Let me just recap this real fast. This is talking about your work ethic. Okay, We ought to work properly. Work as unto the Lord and not unto men. And in this particular case, it's saying if your boss is a Christian, uh, don't despise him because he's your brother. Like just because you go to the same church and you're on the same playing field in the same level as Christians, equal in essence in nature, both brothers in the Lord, uh, at work, He's still above you. Amen. That's all it's saying. Make sure you're able to submit to the leader even if He's your brother. Good. Even though there's a special connection there in the work environment, He's still the boss. Verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he's proud, 
knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, which from some come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings. Now, I'm going real fast over these words, but these are good words to judge yourself in. Useless wranglings of men, corrupt, of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Verse 6, now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in, in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, or the root of all evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Stop there. Notice this. He commands us to not love money. Those that desire to be rich will fall into temptation and a snare. How many of you desire to be rich? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> now we have to be very careful here because we have learned as, as good Bible students how much God says about money and how He has promised by covenant yeah. to bless the house of the just. Yeah. That the house of the righteous will be filled with riches and wealth. Yes. Psalm 112. I mean, over and over, he delights in the prosperity of his servant. Yes. And as a believer who walks with God, we have access to divine supply, divine Hallelujah. blessing, divine covenant Ooh, prosperity, wow. what, which means we can have a full supply in every way for every material need and want in the earth. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, that our cup can always run over. And that, that we, we always are abundantly supplied from God for every good work. Right. It's great news to know that He has supplied all of our need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's wonderful to know that we don't ever have to worry about money because He will always care for His children right. because His children are better than flowers, Amen. better than birds, Amen. and He cares for birds and He cares for flowers. You, Isn't that right? Matthew chapter 6, basic finance for the Christian. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we have to keep that in mind, knowing that if I walk with God by principle, I'll be wealthy. Yet not seek after wealth. Not desire to be rich. I'm happy anyway. Paul said that, whether little or a lot, I'm content. To be abased or to be full, either way I can abound. Does that make sense? So as Christians, we have to be joyful no matter what the circumstances are. That's godliness with contentment. Amen? So the goal is to be godly. The goal is to seek God and find God. And then the other stuff just comes as a byproduct. And in your mind, you have to disconnect from it. The problem is we've heard some of these messages on money and prosperity. And the Christian says, yeah, I want some. And starts pursuing money, desiring to be rich. And they fall into a snare. I've watched it time and time again. Time and time again. And sometimes the thought is a good thought. Well, when I get rich, I can give more money to God. And I can get rich and give more money to God. And so they're trying to be rich. Be careful of that. Certainly we can give more to God when we're richer. Certainly we can. But let's go ahead and start giving to God now with what we do have. Amen. Instead of desiring something that we don't. Amen. All right, number seven. The seventh thing that will be discussed on Judgment Day is our faith walk. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. You'll have to discuss, did you? Yeah. What does that mean? The righteous live by what they believe. Did you live by what you believe? Number one, did you go learn what to believe? And then did you live by it? Uh, Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Can't please God without faith. Now what is faith in a general sense? I mean, we're all here. We must have faith. Faith in a specific sense. I would say faith in the covenant, number one, in the covenant promises of God. Without believing these promises of God and receiving them, or at least attempting to receive them, you're not really believing it enough. 
And so I think on Judgment Day we will discuss, did we go after the covenant promises of God and try to receive the spiritual and material blessings because of our covenant? Then also we'll discuss, did we find out the will of God for our life from Scripture and also from seeking the Spirit on our particular calling and unique individual you know, pathways? Did we find the will of God and use our faith there? Amen. Did we obey the will of God for our life? Mm -hmm. Amen? That's the faith walk, and that will be discussed on Judgment Day. Did we shoot for God's best? Oh, Amen. Or did we just kind of take whatever came because somebody told me, well, it all just happens for a reason and you can just bounce around. And if it's, it happened, it was from God. If it didn't happen, it wasn't from God. Yeah. Right? People say, well, if, 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 well, if it's of God, I'll get it. If, if it's not of God, I won't get it. Yeah. Well, the children of Israel would have never taken the promised land if they had that attitude. Because the promised land was not an easy task. It was not just plopped out of heaven for them. They had to go fight and they ran up. The first city they tried to take was Jericho and it was walled off. There was no open door in Jericho. Right. So we try to teach Christians all the time, don't go, go by the open and closed door routine to decide the will of God. Right. Well, if the door's open, it's from God. So it was open, so I went in. That's right. I was asking God for a spouse and the door rang and it was the post office lady and so I married her. <laughs> Some doors are closed that God needs you to know His will and have faith so you can open them. Amen. Other doors are wide open and God needs you to have faith to hear His voice and avoid them. I thought that was good too, brother. Thank you very much. <laughs> Number eight is particularly probably for Christians, I mean for preachers, um, James chapter 3 verse 1 says not many of you should become teachers uh, because knowing that teachers will receive the greater judgment remember that scripture be ye not many masters knowing that we shall agree to receive the greater condemnation it just means uh, if you're not graced and called of God to be a teacher preacher in the church or to the church don't try to be because you'll get greater judged. Greater judgment comes to those who are responsible for others in the spiritual realm. Yeah. So pastors, preachers, apostles, all the, the, the gifts of God that uh, are in charge, the leaders of the church, the elders of the church, they will be judged even more harshly than everybody else. Or I could say it'll, they'll receive a second judgment. First is a Christian, and that's why we try to teach all preachers, you've got to exemplify Christ as a Christian. Amen. And then you'll also have to, be, you'll have to discuss your pastoring. Did you love the sheep properly? properly? Did you care for the sheep properly? Did you uh, become an example for the sheep? Or did you try to just gain from the sheep? Yeah. All these things. So, so don't worry about all the false preachers out there. Uh, don't worry about those that you don't like and those that seem to manipulate. Don't worry about them. Uh, they're not your servant. They're God's servant. They will stand before Jesus, have to answer for all those things for eternity. So let God take care of that, okay? Amen. You just avoid what you feel like in your heart to avoid and let God take care of the rest. Deal? Amen. Now, turn to Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. We've got to move here so you can see all the glory of God that we're going to see in heaven. I'm trying to talk fast, get all this in today because we don't have time to keep waiting around for teaching and lessons. Jesus might come by before next week. I've got to have you ready. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel or the messenger of the church at Ephesus, write this. These things, things this chapter 2, verse 1. says, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, that you've tested those who say they're apostles and aren't, and have found them liars, and you've persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you've left your first love. What's your first love? We could, there's a whole lot of messages that could come out of this, but I'm going to try to get to the overcoming part so you can see what we can expect if we do overcome. Remember, therefore, from which you've fallen and repent and do the first works, or I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Basically, take your church out. 
But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we're going to get to eat from the tree of life if we overcome. This reward day, this is end day, this is fun day. I don't know what the tree of life tastes like, but I'm getting some. Amen. Amen. Chapter, I mean, verse 8. To the angel of the messenger of the church in Smyrna write these things, says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. Even if you're poor, God's looking at you, Jesus looking at you, thinking you're rich anyway. It'll turn around. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will uh, have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. There's the second crown. The crown of life will be given for those that are martyred or killed for their faith or persecuted heavily for their faith. You'll get a martyr's crown. You'll get the crown of life. Now notice here that it says, Jesus says the devil's about to do something to you. Now the inquiring mind, if you've never read much, you have to think, why didn't Jesus stop him? Well, here's why. It's because persecution for your faith is the one thing Jesus won't save you from, necessarily. Persecution for righteousness sake is the one thing that Jesus said you're going to have. All the other calamities, tragedies, sickness, and diseases that, that people have, God promises protection and healing from, but not persecution for righteousness' sake. Jesus said, they persecuted me, and the disciples not above his master, they're going to persecute you. So you can't avoid that. It might be even unto death. You need to be okay with that. And if you did die for your faith, guess what? You get to leave the earth, and you get a crown in heaven. Verse 11, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's the death where people are thrown into the lake of fire who don't have Jesus. And then we'll skip some of the, all the do's and don'ts and the things Jesus had against these churches and get to the overcoming part. Verse 16, Repent or else I'll come to you quickly and I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone. And on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. We get a new name in heaven. Now if you like your name now, I guess you could maybe keep it. And you can have your name and your new name, but I'm going for the new name. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you get to eat the hidden manna. So I don't know what the hidden manna tastes like or what the white stone looks like or what the new name really is all about, but it, it seems to be important to God. Jesus told it, so it must be glorious. It must be glorious. Just must be glorious. Last night we had a, a tongue and interpretation from God or maybe just a prophecy that, um, that it, it's better than can be described on paper. God said it's even better than I could describe it in the words. Verse 18. Uh, or let's skip, skip down to verse 25. But This is the church at Thyatira. It says, But hold fast what you have till I come, and he who comes and keeps my works till the end... To him I'll give power over the nations. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. They'll be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I've also received from my Father, and I'll give him the morning star. I'll give him the morning star. What's the morning star? Well, most theologians agree that the morning star is Jesus. It's the Son of God. So if we already have the Son of God, how's He going to give us the morning star? How's He going to give us the Son of God? And really... It's because everything we receive from God's kind of in stages anyway. I mean, we've got eternal life now, but, you know, it kind of, we feel it sometimes, we don't feel it sometimes. We've got the Holy Spirit now, sometimes we feel Him, sometimes we don't. Uh, we've got blessings now, but sometimes it's more clear than other times. But when we get to heaven, He's going to give us the splendor of Himself, the glory of Himself that we tasted here, we're going to get in full measure there. 
So the glow that emanates from Jesus, he's going to give to us. Hallelujah. The morning star glows, he's going to give us the glow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? The Bible says when we see him, we're going to be just like him. And that's the moment that he's going to impart his whole nature. We're going to get the whole thing just like Jesus. Hallelujah. Look at chapter 3. Turn to chapter 3, verse 4. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I'll not blot his name from the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Notice you'll get some white garments and you won't have your name blotted out if you overcome. You've got you to remain faithful till the end. You've got to believe God till the end. Hallelujah. And there's a whole lot to say about that. Don't, don't get all worried that I've got something going wrong. We, we need hours of teaching to explain some of these things. Just realize this is what Jesus said, not me. Chapter 3, same chapter here. Verse 10. Because you have loved me and kept my commandment to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Hallelujah. Notice that. What's that hour? That's the tribulation. He says that if you will persevere, hold the commandments and persevere, He'll help us avoid the tribulation of the earth, the seven-year tribulation. If you persevere, you will go in the rapture. Did you know that? That you have to overcome and persevere to, to escape the tribulation. At least it appears that way. Verse 11, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one takes your crown. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he'll go out no more. I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Glory. Did you know when you get to heaven, you're going to get a tattoo? I got everybody's attention now. It's a holy tattoo. The artist, Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I prefer to wait for Jesus, the holy artist, to give me a holy tattoo in heaven rather than dodo down the street before. We're talking holy tattoo on glorified bodies. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> now don't leave the church saying, Pastor said I'd get a tattoo as long as it was holy. So I'm going to go get a dove. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I'll come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Remember how awesome and glorious it was? Jesus went up and sat down with the Father. You get to do the same thing. Sit with Jesus on the throne. Uh, uh. Glory. We are kings and priests unto God and we get to sit on the throne of dominion with Jesus. We get to rule the nations. We get to be a pillar of God. We get new names. We get to eat good holy stuff in heaven. Glory. We get to partake of all the glory that Jesus has partaken of. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, let's run real fast through the crowns that are mentioned in the Bible. Now, we've talked about, uh, turn to the book of James. Let's read a couple scriptures. We won't be long now, but let's uh, make sure we understand crowns. Now, there's five crowns mentioned. I don't know how it's all going to pan out if we, like, have a shelf or a closet in our mansion that has different places for our crowns. Like, I'm going to wear this crown today, and I'll wear this crown tomorrow. I don't know if it's going to be like that. 
Or if it's going to be like a button that you push, I want you to see this crown on me and then this crown on me. And got the crown of life today. Tomorrow I'm going to let everybody see the, in, in, the imperishable crown. Or if it's just all clear that you got five. You're wearing one, but it's all five together and you can tell the difference. I don't know. Uh, but I do know that it's enough for Jesus and the Holy Spirit to mention these things in the Bible. Amen. So it must be glorious. It must be awesome. Some people hear this message and think, well, as long as I got one crown, it's fine. No, no, let's go on for God's best. James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Amen. So the crown of life is given to those who love him. Yeah. Amen. Now we've already mentioned the imper imperishable crown or incorruptible crown. Uh, remember Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but la rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven yeah. where no thief can get it. Amen. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, let me read you that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, this one appears to be the soul winner's crown, the witness, or the witness crown. The person sharing their faith gets a crown. Those who have devoted themselves to the Great Commission and yielded to the Holy Spirit and been a witness on this earth will receive a special crown. And it's called technically the crown of rejoicing. Notice how Paul refers to it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 19 or we'll start with verse 17. He's speaking to the church at Thessalonica saying, Hey, I'm thinking about you guys. And then he gives them a, a term here. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoring more eagerly to see your face with great desire, therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? So he's asking, what's our crown? Is it not even you? in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ it is coming. So when Jesus appears, those who we brought to the Lord will be our crown. Yeah. Oh, wow. Somehow it will be shaped in the crown and it will be known that we led people to Jesus. Wow. Amen? Amen? So that will be the glory of it when Jesus comes. Did we bring anybody with us? Hallelujah. 2 Timothy, five pages right. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Paul says to Timothy, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. Notice Paul, before he died, knew he was going to die. Isn't that a good way to go? Yeah. I think you ought to have faith in that kind of way so that you don't have to be fearful of death. He'll let you know when it's time to go. If, you've satisfied your, if you're satisfied and if you've filled the, the call of God on your life, he'll let you know when it's time. You don't have to be worried about that. And you don't have to fight beyond the day. Amen. Some people are still scared to die because they don't know if it's right or wrong. Well, walk with God and He'll let you know everything. Paul knew this though too. Verse 7, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. So if you're prepared for test day, you got a big smile on your face. When you hear the first, the first blast of the trumpet, the first blast of the trumpet, if your first thought is, just think about it. First Peter chapter 5, final scripture. Then it's lunchtime. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. This crown appears to be that for the leaders and elders of the church. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort, whom a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, or, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. 
And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, again, words can't describe the physical reality of things and the feeling of the physical reality of things when we arrive and stand before the judgment seat. But right now, we can take these words and believe these words and trust God. And this is where, you know, there's an element of faith where we don't know all the detail, but we do trust the word from God enough to order our lives aright, to pursue spiritual things ahead of natural things, to commit our lives, to recognize that Natural pursuits are but so temporary in this life. That's right. Natural pleasures are so temporary. Belongings are so temporary. Even relationships here can be temporary. So even though we put emphasis in relationship, first make sure our spiritual life is right with God. Hallelujah. Yes. I think discussion day with Jesus is going to be glorious for us. And the more and more we're prepared, the more and more we've already predicted these things, believed these things, looking forward to these things. You know, now that you know there's five crowns, you ought to think about that occasionally. I want to get some crowns. I remember used to when I was a little kid, they'd talk about heaven, you know, having different levels or whatever. And I used to have the, the thought that many people have, of, well, I don't, I'll probably be on the lowest rung in heaven, but that's good enough for me. <laughs> Come on, yo dummy. Don't act like that. Get saved. Get born again. Come into the kingdom of God. Mean it. Let's do it right. If we're going to do it, let's run the race to win. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's get fit. Let's run the race. Let's shed the extra poundage if we have to. Whatever thing's holding us back, lay aside the weights and the sins that stop us from reaching our mark and hitting our goal and seeing our Jesus work in our lives. Amen. 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 And on that final day, when the Lord comes, He'll have no trouble recognizing you and me. Because right. we will have done it right. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ and building strong Christians who can impact their world and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online, by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas and looking for a good home church, Pastor Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. To watch services via live streaming or for more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web or download our Houston Faith phone app or catch our Houston Faith TV Roku channel.